All right. So um, the PDF of all of the slides are up in Blackboard, so you can download them. And I try to put them up in advance of class, so that way for folks that actually want to print out a copy and make the notes along the side, you can. I can't remember if I mentioned that in the first week, um, but I think one of these were up for a while, and the other one I think I forgot to put up until about three hours ago. Um, but I think this was the one that was up in advance that you could have saw. So um, essentially what we're going to look at is what a good research manuscript should like, which incidentally is also what a good thesis should look like in terms of the structure. So you'll get a good sense both of things that you should be looking for as you're consuming the research that you're looking at this semester, but also how your actual thesis is going to play out over the next 10 or 11 months as we're constructed. So when you're looking at any good manuscript as well as any good thesis, there are going to be six sections that you're going to focus upon. Now in some cases the results in the discussion will be combined, for example, for all of your theses. The results in discussion will be combined into a single section. Actually, that's going to be your chapter four. Um, what you tend to find is most quantitative or most researchers that come from a more post-positivist perspective, and essentially what that means is people that think that the truth is a concrete thing that you can actually discover if you have discrete enough instrumentation that you can figure it out. Those type of people will tend to have these six sections. So they'll have a separate results and discussion. Um, most people that come from more of a constructivist, and not a constructivist in terms of pedagogical kind of constructivism, but a research paradigm, a constructivist research paradigm, which are essentially people that think that um, truth is relative, so that knowledge is relative based upon essentially what society says it is or what society generally accepts it to be. Um, most of those people also tend to be more qualitative in nature. Those folks will tend to combine a research and discussion section. So oftentimes you can tell the, a researcher's epistemological bent by how they've set up those two sections. If they're separate sections, um, you know, they're like the X-File guys. You know, the truth is out there and it's just a matter of trying to discover it. If they are combined sections, they realize that truth is more of a nuanced construct. Um, that society comes up with. Now that's, well, if you guys were in a doctoral course right now, we would have actually spent about four weeks on epistemologies and research paradigms. Um, you guys got the 30-second version of it. Um, but that tells you a little bit about essentially what the researcher is trying to accomplish. So these are your six sections. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the six, and I'm sort of going to dissect what each of them are designed to do and what you should expect to see in each one. So starting off with the introduction. Essentially, the introduction is going to do three things. So if you're thinking about your own chapter one, there are going to be three pieces in your own chapter one. Each of them are going to be about a page to a page and a half, two pages at the most in length. The first thing it's going to, I shouldn't say the first thing, because the first two tend to be interchangeably in terms of the order. Um, so it's going to introduce the context and introduce the problem with some literature support. Now, what I told my 690 students when they got to the <coughs> chapter one point, a lot of it depends upon how you came to your topic. If you sort of had a specific topic in mind and then went looking through the broad field of the literature, and ended up settling in on the same topic that you started off with, chances are you're going to start off talking a little bit about the context because that's essentially how you came upon your study. And then you're going to talk, you know, here's some essentially a brief introduction to what I found in the literature. And then, you know, here's what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the document. If you didn't have a specific thing in mind and you just knew I wanted to do something on X, and, you know, the X was your broad topic. And then based upon what you found in the literature, you saw, oh, there's four areas that really need research, and I'm going to pick this one right here. Then you might want to start off by introducing the literature first and then talking about your own personal interest. Now, the context basically is essentially how did you come to this topic? You know, there are literally thousands of things within the field of education that you could have selected. You know, what brought you to this particular area? You know, what struck your interest in the first place? Um, the second there 
is again that idea of just some of the initial literature. So it's not going to be that sort of very structured, very specific literature review kind of thing that you're going to produce with this class. This is sort of, you know, the 30,000 foot kind of view where you're just talking in very broad generalities, setting the reader up for. Uh, the way I like to describe this is if they stopped reading after the first four pages of your thesis, or in this case, the first two paragraphs of a manuscript, of a research uh, article, would they have some sense as to why you're interested in it and what's the problem with some specific literature reference? Moving to the next section, or chapter two for your thesis, the literature review. Now this is the one that is a little bit more important for you guys right now because this is essentially what you're going to be producing in this class. Unlike chapter one, or for that matter, chapter three, which are very structured and lockstep and pattern. I think I talked a little bit about this in the first class where I told you I can tell you sort of you're going to have a page of this, a page of that, a couple of pages of this for chapters one, for chapter three, and for chapter five. Chapter two and chapter four, your literature review and your results and discussion, I can't tell you that. There is no real outline to it other than sort of some broad general guidelines that I can give you. Um, of basically how it's going to start and how it's going to end, but the 25 pages in the middle, 20 pages in the middle, that's really going to vary depending upon what you find in your literature. Um, you know, so it, it's kind of like the black hole of, of the literature review, if you will. So a couple of general comments about the literature review. Um, the literature review is a critique, not a summary. And that's an important thing. Uh, it includes all of the relevant, and I highlight the word relevant literature there. You do not need to include every single thing that has ever been written on your topic. You will make decisions about, you know, this isn't good research. I have this same theme, this same point made by these four articles. Two of them are really good, and two of them, you know, one of them is not a journal article. It's more of an opinion piece. The other one is just bad research, so I'm not going to include those two. Um, you know, you're going to make decisions about those things. Just because you find it and it's about your topic doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to show up in your literature review. You know, and it might be good research. It just might be, you know, there are eight people that are making this point. I'm going to decide to cite four of them. The other four, you know, yeah, they're making the same point, but, you know, I don't want essentially two lines worth of citation just for this one sentence. You know, so, I mean, that's one of the, you know, decisions you're going to make. And in some cases, it may be that I'm going to, you know, use this person this time, but when I get down here to another area where they both make the same point, I'm going to choose the other person. Or it might be this one here is more recent. Or I know I'm more interested in urban areas, and these two here are focused more upon urban areas, where this guy is out in the rural area, so I'm not going to include him because he's not as relevant as the other two. You know, these are decisions that you make as a researcher. A good literature review will essentially, when you look at the sources of it, will have a range of dates, will have a range of publication sources, and will have both the seminal pieces and the obscure pieces. Right? You know, and this gets to that thing, you know, if you see that as you're searching, not only does this name keep appearing, but everyone who isn't that person always cites that person, you know that that's a seminal person in the field. Um, oftentimes it's the person that came up with whatever particular label or monkey or theory or whatever. Um, and you know a lot of these people already. Uh, not necessarily in your particular field, but you know a lot of seminal folks. You know, behavioralism. Skinner. You know, constructivism in terms of a learning theory. Come on, guys. 1960, French guy, Piaget, right? Social constructivism. This guy's a Russian. Vygotsky. Vygotsky. Right? I mean, you know, there are seminal folks within, you know, the field of education. Multiple intelligences. Gardner. Gardner, right? These are the folks that were the first people to come up with it, which means they're probably, in all likelihood, the person that's written the most about it. They're the person that everybody cites. 
Um, so let's look at a couple of these. It is important to note, and I will stress this again, it is not a summary, not a summary, not a summary. It is absolutely useless for you to say such and such said this, such and such wrote that, such and such stated this. Um, next week we'll actually have some samples of that where I'll sort of build on, you know, here's a summary, here's uh, different areas of a critique. Now there are two ways of doing a critique. One is to provide enough context to the reader so that the reader can make judgments about the veracity of the claims that the author is making. Essentially that you're providing enough information so that the person reading your document can determine is this good research or bad research? Is this something I should believe or that I should question? The other way of doing it is to actually make that evaluation for your reader. You know, and there's a lot of subtle ways of doing this. Um, you know, based upon unsystematic observations. Uh, such and such opined about, such and such believed, without any data to support his claims, such and such. You know, I mean, you're not basically coming out and saying this guy's full of crap, but, you know, you're hinting at the fact that you should be suspicious or at least questioning of what this person has written because they don't really have much to back it up. You know, or based upon this longitudinal study over a five-year period involving hundreds of thousands of students, such and such found. You know, again, I just provided a little bit of context there. You know, so those are the kinds of things that, and I know I'll have samples next week as we go through this. Um, you know, so that you can see sort of some of the contextual cues or some of the evaluative cues that you could include in there. And in some cases, they're not that, you know, they are subtle in nature so that researchers know when to pick them up. Um, so lots of times when people say stated or said or wrote, oftentimes that means it's not based upon research. When such and such found, such and such reported, generally speaking, that tends to mean that it's based upon data. Now, not necessarily good data, but, it, you know, those are some of the contextual cues that as you're reading through your literature reviews uh, and the articles you're finding, you know, authors will do that. And they do it in that sort of subtle way because other researchers know, you know, what those cues mean. One of the useful, the Boot and Beal article that was uh, one of the readings for this particular week on uh, the centrality of the literature review and research, <coughs> they do a good job about talking about the literature review being a critique and not a summary. Um, and, you know, that's one that, in all honesty, I, I've i taught um, honors research essay classes for undergrads, and I use that article with them. I use it when I teach master's thesis. I use it for the six-year thesis. I use it with my doc students. I think it's, in all honesty, one of the most useful articles that I've come across when it comes to not just the importance, but that specific issue of the literature review being a critique and not a summary. Um, so if you haven't read it already, uh, you know, look at it through that particular lens. If you have read it, um, it's worthwhile going back and skimming, not now, but say about four weeks from now, mm -hmm. five weeks from now, when we start actually writing the literature reviews, because that's when you're going to, you know, it'll have some of, the, again, that critique kind of thing. Um, the third section is the methodology section. This one, like I say, like chapter one, is very structured. So I can tell you that these are the essentially, um, well, in your case, it'll be the first five items. In fact, that sixth item, and that's why it's italicized, tends not to, well, you see it in a lot of qualitative dissertations. You see it in some qualitative theses. Uh, you see it in some articles that are written for qualitative journals, so like the International Journal of Qualitative Research or the Qualitative Report. But outside of that particular field, you tend not to see the subjectivity statement. Uh, you just see the other five. So you've got your research design, which is your first piece. This essentially we tend to call the methodology. Uh, you will hear me call it the methodology throughout the next year. <laughs> Essentially, it just talks about the framework that your study is going to follow. So is it a case study? Is it an ethnography? Um, is it a randomized control trial? Is it a quasi-experimental study? Is it a phenomenology? 
Um, and, you know, when we get to 690, we'll actually spend a class where we look at each of those different ones. Um, is it action research? Most of you in here will likely be doing either a case study or action research. Um, <coughs> that's the way it historically shakes down, and I see no reason why you guys would be any different. Um, but essentially, it's a couple of pages that outline... Well, in the case of the thesis, in the case of a research manuscript, it's often a couple of sentences, maybe a full paragraph, that outlines this is the framework that the research took. Now, in research articles, it may only be a sentence or two. And there's a reason for that. A, because most journals only allow you between 3,500 to 7,500 words. And, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of time talking about methodology there because... All I need to do is say I'm doing a case study and cite Stake 1995, and anyone who knows educational research knows what my case study is like, because they're familiar with the type of case study that Yin or sorry that Stake recommends. Or if I did Yin 2014, um, you know, again that's another case study researcher talks about a very specific type of case study. So within a journal article, you'll probably only see a sentence or two with the appropriate citation because folks in the field will know what that means. You know, if you're using action research, you're following Stringer's model as opposed to, um, oh, what's the Aussie's name? It's not coming to me off the top of my head. The Aussies are always big with action research. They were the ones that pioneered most of the literature about it. And I can't remember the big guy's name. He's at Monash University. You think I'd remember like his name and not these obscure facts about him, but <laughs> no, it's not coming to me. Um, you know, but based on who you cite, the author, the readers will often know the type of methodology you've selected. In your case, that'll probably be a couple or three paragraphs, so about a page, page and a half, because you're actually going to develop it out in terms of, you know, th this is the person I'm using, this is how I understand, you know, the way he describes or she describes case study or action research or ethnography or randomized control trial, and this is how it's actually going to look in my study. Um, the next is the research setting. Next, you get the data collection methods. That's essentially where I go in and tell you, essentially, this is where I'm getting my data. For your purposes, you will have two paragraphs, sorry, two to four paragraphs about each method of data collection. So if you're doing interviews or focus groups or surveys or observation or some kind of testing, um, actually, those are probably the most common ones that you guys are going to use. You'll essentially use one or two paragraphs that essentially provide sort of the literature rationale and how you understand that particular method and then you're going to have a paragraph or two that describes how you're actually going to operationalize that in your study you know interviews are appropriate to collect these types of data you know, you'll have a citation and, you know, because it is more appropriate to collect this type of data as opposed to other types of data um, you know, and then what's that going to look like in your study? Well, I'm going to do in-person interviews in a um, neutral setting. They're going to be about a half hour in length. They're going to be audio recorded and then transcribed. You know, or they're going to be over the phone or through Skype. And, you know, within that first paragraph, you know, there's a lot of literature that talks about the advantages of doing things in person um, as opposed to through some sort of technology-mediated medium or doing things at a neutral location or maybe at the person's school or home or wherever they feel comfortable. You know, and there's rationale as to why you would do one over the other. And, you know, so these are the things that you'll talk about in that particular section. Um, like the methodology <coughs> discussion in most research manuscripts, that's probably only going to be a sentence or two or three. And again, they're just going to put the citation in there because if I'm talking about um, Seedman's model for interviewing, I know exactly what type of interview I'm doing. Actually, what type of interviews I'm doing because Seedman talks about doing three interviews. Um, they're all relatively short in length, 15 to 25 minutes. They cover three different types of topics, whereas if you're looking at um, Patton, Patton recommends actually repeating the same interview over multiple settings. 
um, you know, both in terms of to see if answers change, but also to see if time changes the responses. You know, so within the actual articles you look at, again, that's probably the data collection methods, probably only going to be a sentence or two or three with the appropriate citation. Similarly, the data analysis methods. Likely in the research articles you're reading are going to be a sentence or two or three with the appropriate citation for your thesis will be two to four paragraphs for each method of data analysis. You will have one method of data analysis for each type of data. Most of you in here will likely have one or two types of data. You're likely to have text. So if you're doing interviews or focus groups or those kinds, of, that's going to generate text. You're also likely to have numbers. You know, if you're doing surveys or if you're doing any sort of testing or, you know, instruments, that kind of stuff, that's going to generate numbers. Most of you in here probably won't have any other types of data. That particularly gets important when you get to the reliability and validity because that essentially looks at how good is the research. What did the researcher do to ensure that the data that they collected was able to accurately answer the research questions and that the data that they collected was valid. Now, if you're doing, if you're reading quantitative stuff, they're likely going to give you a statistical number. Uh, it's going to be an, what they call an alpha, which oftentimes is, you know, the Greek symbol that you'll see in the articles that you're reading. Um, and basically, you're looking for, you know, alpha that's point f point zero 0.05. Um, which essentially means that they, from a t statistical standpoint, are 95% confident that what they found was actually there and not just due to random chance. And that's, you know, within statistics, that's the goal, to be 95% confident. 90% confident or an alpha of 0.1 is acceptable in educational research, although you don't see it that often. Um, in things that really matter, like life and death kind of things, um, you will often see people using an alpha of 0 0.01. So essentially there's only a 1% random chance kind of thing. Now, the fourth section, which will be the first part of your chapter four, and most people will put these two parts together. Like they won't have results in the first half and discussion in the second half. They'll actually have results and discussion throughout. So they often title their section results and discussion, like you will title your chapter four results and discussion. Um, but the results, essentially, this is what we found. Um, oftentimes, this will be reported in one of two ways, either by theme or by data collection method. By theme tends to be the far most common way, unless one thing informs another. You know, so I did this survey to get all of these general trends, then I interviewed 10% of the people that I surveyed to find out more about these general trends. You know, that would be a good time to talk about it in terms of data collection method. You might talk about, okay, here's the results from the survey first. Now, based upon those results, I went and interviewed people, and this is what I found out from those interviews. In most cases, they're going to put all that data together and say, the themes from all of my data are this. You know, here's sort of the three themes. Theme one, talk about it. Theme two, talk about it. Um, I'm going to skip over the examples because I've got a student that's going to be coming in in a second. Um, actually in about three minutes, um, so I'll skip over the sample examples that I had here, but you'll see them in, um, in Blackboard in the notes that are there. So the discussion, as I mentioned in, I think it was a response to Francis's question, is that uh, essentially it talks about what we found in light of what was already known. So essentially, how did your results jive with the literature review? Which is why a lot of people like talking about them together, because they can say, this is what we found. Now this is how it compares or contrasts with what I told you about 30 pages earlier. Actually, probably be about 15 pages earlier. With the ex rare exception, you will not introduce new literature in your discussion section. It's considered very bad form as a researcher that if you've got a lot of new literature that shows up for the first time in the discussion section. Because if it was that relevant to your topic, it should have been in the literature review in the first place. Now, there will be times where you will find something 
in your results that was totally unpredictable, that really was kind of tangential to whatever topic you were talking about in your literature review. In that case, it is perfectly acceptable to introduce new literature in there because no reasonable researcher would have thought to be looking in that literature in the first place because no reasonable person would have expected to find this sort of unpredictable sort of thing that came up that really hadn't been talked about in most of the literature that I read. As someone in the setting, I really didn't expect to find this kind of thing. You know, so in those kind of situations, it's perfectly acceptable to introduce new literature in, the dis in at the discussion, but that is the rare exception. So in most cases, the things that you're going to find, you might not necessarily be at the beginning of your study say, be able to say, here's the four things I'm going to find, but you might be able to say that based on the 25, 30 pages of my literature review, here's the 12 different things that people have found in different studies about these things. There's a reasonable chance that my study will find one or more of these kinds of things. Now, it might not be a perfect alignment, but at least, you know, it's going to be along the same lines in terms of topics or directions, those kind of things. Um, so there's a sample again. Uh, your conclusions and implications section, like chapters one and three, is very structured. It's going to do three things. A good manuscript will take one paragraph on each of these. You guys will take a page to two on each of them. The first thing is it's going to summarize the manuscript, or in your case, summarize the thesis. The second is it's going to tell me, essentially, you've spent 10 months on this. What can you tell other teachers or administrators or practitioners in your field? You should be thinking about these kind of things based upon what I just learned. And similar to that, the third thing is, now that I've spent 10 months studying this, if I had to do it all again, <laughs> these are the one or two things that I would look at next, or the one or two things I would wish the poor, hapless thesis student coming behind me looks at. 